Hello, everybody. Um, everybody. Hello, everyone. Um, I, uh, my name is John Metzler. I am the, uh, the co-leader with Rita Shore of the Innovation Productivity Institute by the Conference Board. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this uh, next edition in a series of innovation-related uh, webcasts. This is already our second of this year. We're speeding things up. Um, and innovation is all, about, um, is all about connections and unexpected connections. And today, we're going to go and make one of those where we're going to bring um, the concept of seven habits of highly effective people. Many of you should know the book um, or the concept. It's very powerful. And we're going to bring that into the corporate world um, and introduce to you the seven habits of highly effective or of highly innovative organizations, I should say, obviously. Um, before we get into, into the matter at hand, um, I'd like to give you a bit of uh, housekeeping rules, a few housekeeping rules. Um, the first of, uh, of which is to, uh, to really invite you to ask questions. We want to make this as interactive as, as we possibly can. And there's an opportunity for you in the chat box um, at the bottom left of your screen. I will own the questions. Um, and so I will weave them into the conversation um, as I see uh, appropriate and fit. If we don't get to your question, we'll be uh, answering that after the webcast uh, over email. Number one. Number two, you can download the presentation. There's a very clear button on your screen um, and you can do that um, after the presentation is done. Um, you may also look at full screen by, um, by clicking on the four arrows at the top right hand corner. Um, please do not leave um, without, evaluation, with the, without your evaluation. We take your, um, your feedback very seriously. We wanna keep improving and get better um, as we go forward into uh, the continuation of the series. So, so please, it will only take two, three, four minutes, um, and please take that time. Thank you. Um, if you like what you're going to see, which um, which I hope you do, um, which I hope you will, um, please uh, don't hesitate to share it with your colleagues and everybody else that you think could be interested in this. Um, the video is going to be um, available on demand for everyone to watch this complimentary um, after 24 hours, so by about tomorrow this time again. Um, last, I should tell you is you can earn credits, CPE credits. Um, type your full name and address and email address in the space provided. Um, click OK for three pop-ups, three pop-ups that will occur during the program. Um, you need to stay online, therefore, for the entire webcast. You miss one, you don't get the credit, unfortunately. And it's only available for those uh, of for you um, who are uh, live on the webcast, not for those that follow the webcast on demand, unfortunately. With that out of the way, um, I want to introduce our speakers of today. Um, and I want to start with, uh, with Ludwig Malik, um, who I got to know the first time when we were together at the Innovation Masterclass in Palo Alto um, for the conference board last year. Um, it's great to see you again, Ludwig. Thanks for joining us. Ludwig is CEO, CEO of Planbox. And Planbox is a pioneering provider of AI-powered agile innovation software. Um, and Ludwig is going to introduce himself a bit more um, in a second. And he's going to be joined by Lynn Hayes, who is Innovation Product Manager at Honeywell Intelligrated Inc. Um, and she is going to go and, uh, and uh, add some testimonials to some of the concepts that Ludwig is going to introduce. Um, and don't worry about me. I've already mentioned that. Um, with that, I would like to uh, get into, um, into the subject matter. And Ludwig, um, again, thank you. Great seeing you again. Um, I want to hand it over to you. Um, and we'll be interacting uh, throughout the hour. Great, thanks, John. And uh, it's great to have the opportunity to join the webcast and have also the opportunity to have uh, the conversation with Lynn Hayes, who's joined us with Honeywell. So I think we can all agree we're really living in exciting times. Uh, there are a lot of possibilities, obviously, for organizations who know how to take advantage of the opportunities that are ahead. Uh, so at Planbox, we've been really fortunate because we've had the chance to work firsthand with some of the world's most innovative organizations, and we've been able to see what helps them win, no matter the size or the industry. So as John mentioned, this presentation and concept was actually uh, inspired by Stephen Covey's best-selling book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And we've actually adopted that to the seven operating principles that helps organizations really cultivate an agile mindset so that they can continuously remain agile and innovative. Uh, so these uh, principles really mirror the actions that these organizations are taking in the marketplace day in and day out as there are changes in the competitive landscape, market dynamics, or consumer behavior. Of course, uh, these principles uh, have to evolve to become habits over time for the organization to continue to remain innovative. So with that, I just wanted to give you some 
quick background on Planbox. Uh, you know, our organization is really focused on helping organizations thrive by transforming the culture of innovation. Uh, we've had the opportunity to do this uh, for better ha half uh, of the last 20, uh, 25 years and uh, have an operation uh, you know, globally and uh, serve some of the organizations uh, that you see here, uh, some of the most uh, recognized brands uh, in the world. And most importantly, we've been fortunate enough to see them really succeed in their innovation efforts. Uh, over the last uh, uh, several years as they've been able to adopt some of the principles and actions that we're going to be sharing in today's presentation. So with that, I'll just hand it over for Lynn for some quick background on Honeywell. Hi, thanks Ludwig. So you see the statistics on the slide in front of you. We were founded in 2001, that is Intelligrated, but we were acquired by Honeywell in 2016. Our headquarters is in Mason, Ohio, um, and our products and services span across North America and also Canada, Brazil, and China. So you can see the description of Honeywell and Intelligrated below, but in layman's terms, I wanted to bring this home to you as the consumer. Let's say when you place an order, um, let's just choose Amazon. Everyone seems familiar with Amazon. Honeywell Intelligrated provides solutions that help retrieve the item from the warehouse, distinguish that items from others, apply appropriate labeling, and sort and convey these items in preparation for shipping. All this with the expectation of 99.9% .9 accuracy and, of course, lightning speed. Companies that embrace this e-commerce movement are producing rapid growth. But specifically, as it relates to innovation, our innovation program has experienced tremendous success in an organization that produced 30% year-after-year growth. Our latest robotic innovation, which is shown in the picture at the bottom with a red border, to date has generated an ROI of $13 million. Innovation continues to be an integral part of our culture and a driving force since its inception in 2013. There are many factors that contribute to our program's success, and when analyzed, fall comfortably within the seven habits being presented today. In this webinar, I will be sharing examples of how these seven habits were successfully applied within Honeywell Intelligrated. Ludwig, back to you. Thanks, Lynn. All right, so let's look at these uh, seven innovation habits. As you can see, you can uh, look at the roots taking hold and giving rise to a beautiful and healthy tree that is strong. It's able to take advantage of its surrounding while dealing with elements that may not be within its control. Uh, so as we kind of go through these habits, I'll share uh, one innovative organization we've had the opportunity to work with that exhibits these habits, and I'll talk about what they do right. And I'll turn it over to Lynn along the way so that she can speak about how each of these habits have actually been applied or are being applied at Honeywell. So these uh, habits are, number one, be proactive. Second, begin with innovation outcomes in mind. Habit number three, prioritize your innovation efforts. Four, master your information. Five, seek to engage. Six, design thinking to win, and finally, self-destruct. All right, so I hope uh, I've piqued your interest, so let's dive into it and, and discover each of these habits. So number one, being proactive. I think, uh, you know, very appropriately, this is uh, the first habit we want to uh, discuss because obviously with all the change that's going on in the world and how fast things are moving, the potentially sometimes uncertain political climate the fact that industry lines are blurring more than ever as organizations think about new opportunities to expand their offerings, it's even more important for organizations to really be proactive in the way they go about their business. Now, building an innovation ecosystem really goes to the heart of being uh, building an organization that will ultimately be as proactive as they need to be. And as you can see here, this really means that they are going to find ways to tap into the collective intelligence of their employees, understand how 
best to serve their customers, work with their partners and suppliers, and really expand from there and, and make sure that on an ongoing basis, they have an opportunity to network and connect with universities and researchers, with the startup community, as well as the general public. And you'll notice that the level of influence that these various contributors will have and ultimately the contribution they will make will kind of vary depending on how close they are to the inner circle and then move outward from there. Uh, so in our innovator spotlight, we have Comcast and they've done a really interesting job of uh, really tapping into the diversity and inclusion of their organization and make sure that they're using that diversity to be able to uh, build the right communities and ultimately understand what are the innovations that should be recognized as well as what is the learning that is obviously occurring as maybe things don't necessarily go out as planned and but still should be recognized along the way. So really this innovation ecosystem that the organization will put in place will give it that those strong roots that it needs. After all, you know, trees are the longest living organisms in, in, uh, on earth and they never die of old age. Uh, so really by having this innovation ecosystem, the organization will have the opportunity to have those solid roots that it needs so that it can continuously get the nourishment it requires in, in way of new feedback, uh, in way of collaboration and ideas so that it can grow on an ongoing basis. So with that, let's see how Honeywell is being proactive. Lynn? Great, thanks. So when thinking about the design of our program, it was imperative to capture multiple perspectives and of course to maximize our ideation potential. To achieve this lofty goal, we constructed a 65-member innovation ecosystem. The ecosystem consists of four company divisions. These divisions are broken down into 16 line of business innovation promotion teams. Each one of these teams are led by the line of business product manager and comprised of subject matter experts. I am the only dedicated FTE in the ecosystem. So what that means is all other 64 of the members participate and contribute to the innovation program in addition to their normal jobs. Some members make it a small part of their day, others a required part of, it, required part of their day. But leveraging the diverse skill sets, experience, and perspectives provides a measurable insight as well as a diversified approach to innovation. But what does that mean in real time? That means that submitted ideas can be validated quickly and accurately. Ideas can be enhanced through the collaboration of diverse product experience and industry knowledge. And this collaboration then causes a chain reaction, a bonus, if you will, that sparks new ideas arriving at the best possible solution for solving the problems. Ludwig? Great, Lynn, thank you. So let's look at innovation habit number two. Begin with innovation outcomes in mind. Now, I know this one, kind of sounds obvious. Unfortunately, Ludwig. it's something that... Uh, Ludwig. John, I got a question. <laughs> yes. I want to go back to your number one. I have a question. Yes. Um, this one, number one to me sounds uh, declaring that innovation is everyone's job. Um, and so I find that always a very profound statement, including, by the way, your external uh, ecosystem around you that supports you. Um, how do you... Um, um, some companies actually set up innovation organizations, while the rest of the of the organization may, may may keep on doing its same old thing. How do you what, what do you think of that? And how, and how do you deal with this in in your in your efforts? Uh, sorry. Uh, so the question is around how you're going to adjust your innovation program. Some some organizations decide to set up innovation organizations within the organization, while the rest of the organization keeps on doing what they've been doing. Um, have you have you encountered any of this, um, and what's your what's your take on this? So I think there are obviously you know various ways organizations go around doing this, and of course it largely kind of depends on how they define innovation, which ultimately uh, you know determines what is the areas of focus that they're going after. Uh, if you ask me, what you know would be the ultimate uh, you know best way of approaching it 
would be think to think of their uh, innovation organization as the center of excellence, uh, very much uh, similar to how an organization will put together a project management office to drive best practices for project management. If they can approach, this, approach it in, in a similar way, more holistically, then this innovative organization becomes a shared services that provides those best practices to the rest of the organization. Otherwise, uh, as you uh, were kind of asking that question, uh, it would become something where innovation becomes the responsibility for some people in the organization, but not necessarily being viewed as something that is going to become the collaboration work of everyone in the company. Exactly, so that would be the fear. Great, this is excellent, thank you. And by the way, Lynn, this is the way that you just described it as well, right? You were the center, the, 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 the what's the word? The center, I guess, of the effort, and, and people within the organization were doing a bit more, a bit less, but everybody was into the game. So, so this came together very nicely. Um, Thank you. I think it was very, very um, illustrating. Move on to number two. All right. So let's look at innovation uh, habit number two. As I was mentioning, you know, innovation outcomes uh, in mind sounds uh, kind of obvious. Unfortunately, it's something that a lot of organizations actually lose sight of as they actually, you know, launch uh, interesting innovation campaigns. And generally, they tend to be viewed as innovation theater because they don't really amount to much. Uh, so uh, in our innovator spotlight, we have Willis Towers Watson. Uh, they have a very small but capable team that has really focused the organization on the innovation outcomes that it needs to achieve, especially after the massive merger of Willis and Towers Watson. Uh, so, you know, if you go back to our three examples, sometimes, uh, you know, we can get distracted with what uh, makes a look a tree look beautiful, but what is really ultimately going to be more important is what is going to drive its long-term health and safety. Uh, so similarly, an organization needs to think about how they structure their innovation program and look at all of these four key areas that I wanted to share with you. Number one, uh, is really around this contributor breakdown structure, which really looks at how you're going to set up your innovation ecosystem, the various contributors you're going to have that will participate in your innovation efforts, understanding their skills, the diversity they're going to be representing, and the role that you want them to play. Then you kind of look into the innovation breakdown structure to understand how you're actually going to track your innovation efforts and kind of go into your uh, identifying your innovation portfolios, the various types of innovation you want to pursue. And this is really all about making sure you're able to look at the investments you're making in research and development and the ROI that you're going to be achieving from these efforts. Next, you want to look into your work breakdown structures. And this is all around understanding how your organization is going to experiment and budget for it accordingly and making sure that you're also extracting the right learnings from these experiments. And very importantly, in the last structure, we have the information discovery structure that really makes sure that all of these other areas are receiving the right information, the right nourishment that they require so that the organization is making the right decisions along the way. So with that, I'll pass it over to Lynn to talk about how these innovation outcomes concept and principle has been applied at Honeywell. Great, thanks. So the rollout of our innovation program in 2013 was a great success. Not because of the exceptional marketing and promotion of the program, although that was part of it, but primarily because of the preparation and collaboration that took place during the creation of our program. So we knew that we must have innovation as an integral part of our corporate focus and initiatives, but needed specific guidelines to help us mold our innovation framework. We found that guidance using a two-step approach. First, we conducted extensive research. Extensive. So what were other successful companies doing? What were the trends and insights that we should consider? And what type and blend of innovation would suit our business model best? Well, we ended up adapting a capital equipment and systems business model and took inspiration from startups and elite consumer packaging companies like, for example, P&G. The second step, 
we conducted the Kaizen event, leveraging all of the research that we had just discovered to mold a framework and build a process to support it. But if you were to ask me what we consider the key ingredient of our program's success, it would be our top-down approach. We definitely put our money where our mouth was. For example, as a company, we made a commitment to the innovation program. We identified it as one of, top, of our top three company initiatives. This came with exposure, performance measurements, and a dedicated focus. We had an executive sponsorship from the CEO and CTO, as well as, a, as, well as the program was supported from a diversified innovation steering committee to help us manage and grow the program. We committed to a fully funded innovation budget, not just for in idea, in, excuse me, not just for idea generation, but with specific dollars dedicated for discovery, the vetting, the testing and prototyping of our ideas and concepts for incremental and disruptive innovation. These thoughtful decisions were put in place from the very beginning to ensure our program would not die on the vine. Great, thanks, uh, Lynn. I guess you want to move to number three now, right, Ludwig? Or you got more? Yes. To... Okay. Let me before you move there. <clears throat> let me reinforce my uh, my invite for questions. We don't. We're not getting any, and there's quite some material shared here. So I'm looking forward to get some of your questions, uh, dear audience. <laughs> um, I um, I wanted to just uh, uh, mention here, um, Lynn. I mean, what you just what you just described is music to my ears. So, I mean, that commitment um, and that sponsorship of the senior management, top-down approach, as you called it, I, I, I hear so often that it's missing in corporations, which leads to a lot of frustration, often a lot of work with very little output. Um, so this was, uh, I think, uh, you know, a great testimony. Um, and then the other thing, Ludwig, I wanted to ask you, out of those four cascading elements that you just showed, which one do you find the, mo the hardest um, to get uh, done in corporations? Or is it too hard uh, so, a question? <laughs> so I think, you know, if you kind of look at uh, the, the structuring of your innovation efforts, I think the, you know, each of these areas kind of has, uh, you know, its own challenges. I think, uh, you know, the area that obviously the organizations probably will uh, have the most uh, difficulty with, and we're going to dive into a little bit more in the upcoming uh, habits, are going to be this uh, innovation breakdown structure. And that's actually, I think, a very good question as I lead into, you know, the innovation habit number three to help uh, organization really understand how they're going to uh, be able to get to the information that they require uh, will kind of largely depend on what is, what is, what is the kind of innovations they want to pursue. And uh, that will really help them structure this area very correctly. Otherwise, it will kind of lead into this effort where they feel like they're they're tracking the right things, but at the end of the day, they will not get to where they need to be in the long run. Excellent. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. We go on to number three. Um, oh, by the way, Yuda Chef, you asked me a question. I just I have a I have a connection problem. I, I will come back to your question a bit later on. Let's move into number three. All number right. Three. So in the third area, we wanted to talk about how an organization thinks about really prioritizing their innovation efforts. And uh, this kind of leads into two areas, right? Do you really understand where your innovation efforts are going and where you're investing in innovation? And do you have an agreement on the types of innovation that the organizations want to pursue? So typically the, the model that is suggested is for the organization to think about spending roughly 70% of its time to at least protect its core business, 20% of the time to look for opportunities to extend and look for other areas that they can, uh, you know, play into and 10% to transform the business over time. Now, the reality is that some of the more highly innovative organizations have actually moved towards more of that 50-50 model where 50% is spent on kind of running the business and 50% of the investments in innovation are being prioritized to change the business. 
Now, in our innovator spotlight, I actually have Honeywell that I think really exhibits this particular uh, habit very well. And you can kind of see why based on the information that Lynn just shared. And it really goes into the process that I think they've built that helps them have a really solid framework to identify what are the innovations that fall into this, what we call the optimal innovation zone. And then they have the right decisioning process to move it forward from there. Uh, it's also important to consider that as you think about, you know, spending more time on changing the business and more of that transformal innovation, you cannot apply the same process to both of these kinds of innovations. And you need to make sure that you identify the types of innovations that these potential ideas that you are uh, pursuing uh, represent so that you can bring the right process to bear, which essentially means that you don't kill off what could be fairly significant and disruptive ideas too early in the process if they take more of that traditional route of how you're going to consider the value for, uh, for your organization. So what we've essentially seen is that the more highly innovative organizations are really good at leveraging their subject matter experts. And they also have a really good process of, uh, you know, leveraging the executive reporting we just discussed in terms of making sure that your executives have the buy-in and the right visibility to what's going on so that you're able to see what innovations really are falling into what is maybe considered not important and urgent. Therefore, they should just be discarded. What are the innovations that are not important and not urgent, which means they don't really align with the corporate strategy and they should also be uh, set aside as much as possible so that the organization can really work on the top area of the quadrant here and spend as much time as it can on the continuous efforts, which are you know, understandably urgent and important to the organization, but it can give itself enough time to operate in what we call the optimal innovation zone where you are doing things that are important but not urgent, understanding that any of these innovations that you're going to pursue, especially the ones that are going to be of the change the business type, will take months, if not years, to see through. So you need to make sure you have enough time to do just that. So with that, I'll ask Lynn to talk about how Honeywell has actually applied prioritizing its innovation efforts. Great. Thanks, Ludwig. So we have a lot of great components and aspects to our innovation program, but I have to admit, priority and focus is an ongoing challenge for, for us. Um, our engineers at Honeywell Intelligrated, well, they love to tinker. They seem to thrive in an environment of discovery. Each idea author, they think their idea is the best and most important. And the CFO, well, they just want to know how much revenue and how fast. So sound familiar? Uh, maybe in your organization you, you experience this as well. But with that being said, I don't want to say passion is, is not a bad thing. It's definitely not when it comes to innovation. However, when faced with making smart strategic choices, especially with limited innovation resources, it does prove challenging. Let me give you an example. Currently, we have over 700 ideas in our pipeline. Some are good, some bad. Some are incremental focused, and others are crazy, disruptive, forward thinking. By the way, we love those. So how do we determine what ideas should be prioritized and progressed through our innovation program? We use a two-part evaluation process to make this determination. So prior to an idea progressing to discovery, we require that that idea be defined and evaluated. The definition takes the form of identifying and understanding the business plan, value proposition, ROI, et cetera. Once defined, the evaluation process begins. So the ideas are evaluated by the appropriate line of business innovation teams. Remember those 16 teams that reside in our ecosystem. Those individuals evaluate the ideas, and they rank them based upon a set criteria. At that point, the prioritization occurs from the ranked criteria. So the results of the ranking are then prioritized into top priority. 
At that point, the individual idea rankings are then prioritized among all discovery and across all lines of business and queued for resource availability. So what will this accomplish? It is a time and resource efficiency along with a clear snapshot of short and long-term priorities. Ludwig, back to you. Thanks, Lynn. It's always interesting to have, obviously, a practitioner you know, share the details and you kind of get a better appreciation of all the intricacies that are required. And, you know, as usual, the devil is always in the details of how these things kind of play out and, you know, building the right system to be able to truly prioritize the organization's efforts. Uh, anything you wanted to add, John, before I move to the next uh, habit? No, not at this point. Recently, I have a technical issue. I cannot, um, I cannot see um, what questions are coming in. So I will pick in, I'll be picking up hopefully when this is resolved in the next two or three minutes. Keep going on number four, unless, unless you see a question yourself, would you want to address it? Uh, all right. Well, let's maybe do number four, and then we'll kind of look exactly. at those in a little bit more detail. Yeah. So the the fourth one that I wanted to share with you is innovation habit number four: master your information. So I think in this uh, day and age, uh, we can all understand and agree that there is a deluge of data and this information is obviously just increasing in pace. And, you know, at the end of the day, for organizations to be able to really thrive in the long run, they need to have a very systematic and programmatic way to be able to tap into that information to understand how they can benefit from it. And of course, this can be, you know, information that is internal or external to the organization that is constantly increasing in size. So if we go back to our example of using the tree, we have the inner bark that really acts as the plumbing system to make sure the right nutrients are distributed to the other parts of the tree to be able to remain healthy and, and function well. So by connecting your company uh, to these other data sources that are going to be available and are obviously abundantly uh, increasing in size, you're going to be able to really tap into three key areas of consideration when it comes to innovation. Number one, and this is obviously a key area that organizations are grappling with today, is what are even the problems we should think about solving? What are the challenges that are most pressing to the marketplace, to our current or our future customers that would be worthwhile investigating? The second area would be to think about, all right, well, now we have potentially some challenges on our hand. Are there any interesting pieces of information that exist, again, internally or externally, that would help guide the way, potentially build some insight or inspiration for our uh, uh, community <laughs> participants to be able to uh, find the right solution? And in the third area, as you think about actually working on the concept and delivering on the ideas that the organization has chosen to pursue, what new information is constantly becoming available that can potentially help in your execution. So in our innovator spotlight, we have actually National Grid, and they've done an interesting uh, job of creating a centralized system of intelligence so that when, for example, someone in the organization in London is starting a, a project to look into blockchain, any contacts they make, any experts they meet, any projects that they pursue and any learning that is achieved along the way is shared with the balance of the organization. So if someone else is looking at something, for example, in Boston, they can understand what has already been done. They can tap into any advantages and new knowledge that has been created, and they don't necessarily have to repeat all that work. So this really kind of falls into what you're going to be doing with it being able to leverage that knowledge across your innovation funnel. As I mentioned, it all starts with looking at what are the problems you're going to be pursuing that are worthwhile and are obviously most importantly going to help your organization uh, get the knowledge that it requires to focus in on the right areas to change the business uh, over time use that information to really frame the right grand challenges for your organization to pursue, and then go into that next step of identifying what would be the right innovation ecosystem partners to invite into the mix, how to collaborate with them to be able to get 
the information and the discussion you want to potentially identify the right solutions. And next, being able to really go into actual execution of your innovation efforts of understanding how do I actually explain the value proposition here to our executive team so that we can get buy-in for what could be potentially a, a many month or a multi-year effort. Uh, and this could obviously be represented, for example, using a business model a canvas and ultimately get the budget you require to run, right, run the right experiments in your organization so that you're able to take the time you need to validate the concepts that your organization has chosen to pursue. And of course, you want to make sure that all of this information is being made available through the right portfolio management practices that your organization has put in place so that you have right visibility across uh, what you see here. And you can obviously make the case that your innovation uh, organization is delivering on its efforts. So let's talk about how Honeywell has actually applied the concept of mastering your information. Great. Thanks, Ludwig. So at Honeywell, we solicit information and gain insights from a variety of channels, internally through our Honeywell community via collaboration, externally through our voice of customer, publicly through our research and technology partnerships, universities and technology companies, and recently with machine learning through analyzing data sets and machine learning models. The information is abundant. However, how you leverage and use that information is key. So for an example, let's use a tool that we at Honeywell call Challenges. We define Challenges as a collaborative way for the company to ask the entire Honeywell community for help with generating ideas for strategic company initiatives, using collaboration to build upon and spark new ideas. So when conducting a challenge, there are two main ways that we leverage the information gained from our channels. First is through education. The information is used to level set the knowledge base of the audience or participants of the challenge. So when the challenge is launched, they are well informed on the topic. The benefit is that we receive much more thoughtful challenge responses. Secondly, stimulus. The information serves to spark new ideas. It promotes different lines of thinking and challenges the status quo. The benefit is more col colorful collaboration among participants, resulting in unique targeted insight and idea generation. On the slide, as a, let's use the example on the slide below. This example is from a floor support challenge. So last year, Honeywell Intelligrated used 43,403 floor supports in our customer solutions. That's quite a few. The focus of this challenge was cost savings. The stimulus that was used to generate and spark ideas was that of Honeywell Intelligrated offerings. So we offer a variety of floor support models. We looked at our competitor offerings. We then went into our manufacturing site in assembly and understood exactly how they were being assembled, the path in which they took to assemble them in the actual on the floor of the manufacturing site. Then we went in and, and, and looked at installation. How long did it take to install these floor supports? What is the cost breakdown of each one of the supports and our sourcing? Could we get a better sourcing line in place? The challenge resulted in over 30 ideas that were generated from this challenge. These ideas were shared with the Honeywell Intelligrated community, consumed by the innovation ecosystem, and then prioritized within our innovation pipeline. The bottom line, this challenge resulted in a 20% savings from the ideas that were implement, implemented from this challenge. Not too bad. Ludwig, back to you. Thanks, Lynn. You wanted to take on some of those questions, John? Somehow, I'm not sure anymore. I'm just looking at the questions that come in. We have a different, they've given me a different system here. Um, I would suggest that we keep going. I mean, I thank you for this story. I was, I was listening very intently. It was really felt like 
this is the pivot between setting direction and then ultimately delivering with execution, with de delivering um, with excellence in execution. And so, um, very interesting to hear the, the sense of curiosity, sense of learning, um, and also you know do that within the boundaries that you have set yourself um, uh, initially. So um, great concept and very nice illustration by by Lynn as well. So thank you for that. Let's move into the next one, and then I'm going to catch up with some questions. Okay. Uh, well, I, I got a couple of the questions here. If you like, I'll, I'll yeah, please. Uh, I'll, if I'll you talk, want, I'll have to pause this along a little bit. Go so I think the, the first question was, uh, you know, how do you, you know, keep the conversation and, uh, you know, the right balance around what are the kinds of innovations that the organization is going to pursue, and to what extent are you using that to make sure the company stays on message in, in what it's, uh, it decides to pursue? And you know, I'll, I'll ask Lynn to. Uh, you know, give her thoughts on, on how Honeywell is doing that. And I think that's definitely, you know, an important challenge, which is why I think to the extent where innovation becomes part of how the company operates, it becomes a lot easier and a lot, uh, you know, uh, simpler for the organization to get the right attention for the long run, right? Otherwise, innovation becomes an activity uh, for a period of time and then it kind of goes away because the company's attention shifts to the here and now and to the requirements for this quarter versus what it's going to actually need to be able to survive and thrive in the long run. So I think any kind of uh, you know attention that is required to be able to deliver on the longer term range uh, requirements will definitely uh, require uh, you know, very important buy-in and uh, attention from your executive team. Uh, so I, I don't know if you, you wanted to add anything on, uh, for this particular question, Lynn? Sure. Um, so in reference to um, kind of the why, why it's important, um, why we have a seat at the table at our organization, why do they value innovation instead of it being a nice to have and it's something that's on RFQs so you must have it in order to um, um, respond to a, a potential sale. Um, we show um, how these innovation ideas feed our organization in reference to breakthrough initiatives. It free it feeds our stage gate process. So these are ideas that affect the bottom line of the organization. Without these innovative ideas, we are um, most certainly challenged with hitting our goals. Not that we can't do it, but it's much easier when we have the tools and a constant supply of ideas to help us achieve that goal. So we really focus on being the feeder um, to the rest of the organization as well as the, hitting the corporate initiatives. Excellent. Ludwig, I would suggest you move on to the next um, uh, habit um, because we have 15 minutes left, 17 minutes left, and you want to cover them all, I presume. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. So let's talk about number five, seek to engage. And, you know, what we've really seen here is that the more highly innovative organizations are able to find that right balance and are able to identify what are the right innovation management activities and campaigns that they should run and then appropriately match up the appropriate engagement mechanics to make those innovation campaigns, you know, very successful. Uh, so let's take a couple of examples. If the organization wants to, for example, understand uh, is there enough awareness around the new strategy or is it really uh, understanding where a new company stands after a massive merger and acquisition has taken place, an innovation jam uh, activity would be the appropriate campaign to think about launching. Uh, whereas if the organization wants to maybe identify more high value business opportunities to lead the way for potentially change the business type innovations, a Shark Tank business competition would be called for. Now, once you've selected the right innovation activity, you need to think about what would be the appropriate set of engagement mechanics. And here we're thinking about what is the right uh, frequency around the event you're going to run? What is the appropriate duration? Who from your contributor breakdown structure and your innovation ecosystem you want to actually invite to the conversation and then you want to break the details down around what would be the appropriate communication plan, the right gamification strategy, 
the right level of executive involvement, and also very important to think about what is actually the, the right level of objective in terms of the engagement rate you're expecting to receive so that you don't necessarily have very high expectations and then you, you kind of set yourself up to fail. Uh, so a good example we've seen in the marketplace uh, in our innovator spotlight is Great West Life, which is an insurance company, and they really had an excellent way of systematically choosing the right line of business that was experiencing a challenge that they wanted to solve, and they were able to launch the right innovation campaigns with the right reward system to get tangible benefits from each of these events that they were running. And ultimately, they, that really helped them build the right positive momentum to get their innovation uh, program off the ground and get a lot more attention to be able to spread innovation across the organization. So I'll ask Lynn to talk about how Honeywell has actually applied habit number five. Great. Thanks, Ludwig. So out of sight, out of mind rings true regardless of how fantastic or well-oiled your program is. One of the key performance indicators of my monthly innovation scorecard is specifically dedicated to engagement. So I track views, visits, submissions, comments, and votes to the innovation portal. I always know the pulse of my organization through this key performance indicator. I routinely leverage this data through a variety of ways. And here's a couple examples that come to mind. I advertise. I internally advertise and promote my innovation program using my organization's communication tools. So for example, Yammer, town halls, intranet, and of course my innovation portal are a couple of examples. There's a very clear and direct correlation between the advertisement of my program to my engagement KPIs. I'm never out of sight, so I'm never out of mind. Secondly, rewards. I incorporated a reward system into my innovation program. It's comprised of intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. So it speaks to associates who want to be recognized as well as those who just want stuff. What are you going to give me? Since my reward system is based on engagement metrics, it's a win-win for all involved. And for the trifecta, I advertise the monthly innovation reward winners. Right, just another way to promote engagement and participation. Now, if we flip to the innovation management side, there's a, we have a variety of innovation tools that we use. The examples are, are our most popular examples are challenges, ideation sessions, and hackathons. So when determining the proper tool, we assess the problem to be solved. There's two criteria used in our assessment, one being severity, so if you're a Covey fan, which Ludwig has already gone over, you'll recognize the four quadrants of importance and urgency. And the other is impact. So we assess the impact of the problem being solved. Does it impact company-wide? Is it a division impact or departmental? It's important to note that we have a best practice process for execution. But the reality is, is that in each instance, it's tailored to the specific needs of the problem at hand. Ludwig? I, I want to just go and, Natalie, we, I'm seeing your question, but I would like to go and answer that um, over email um, because it's very specific um, and we're running a bit short on time um, and we have two more habits to go. I, I do want to make one quick comment. I love your focus on engagement. Um, you know, Gallup says every year 30% of, of folks are engaged. If you want to go and lead with innovation, you have to go and uh, inject it up. By the way, 30% is in the US, it's 16% in Europe. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to go and get people into the innovation game and, and have them go and, and, and do the contribution that you just shared, um, Lynn, very, um, very convincingly. Thank you. Let's move into the next um, habit, please. Fantastic, and exactly. I think we'll be sure to you know, write out the right response to all of these questions. So let's think about habit number six, design thinking to win. So here the organization is really thinking about answering the following questions. Why is it important? What's the problem? How do we solve it? How do we develop it? And does it work? So think of it as, you know, how the leaves of the tree connect to the plumbing system so that it kind of adapts to the, to the environment around it. So likewise, you know, an organization can very easily become out of touch with reality if it does not really stay close to what 
the marketplace and its customer are saying it should really focusing be focusing on, which is really goes to the heart of what design thinking is going to help the organizations uh, accomplish. Now, design thinking is not a new concept. It's been around for more than 30 years. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations either still don't necessarily understand it well, or they have not been able to make it part of their you know, operations. Now, the good news is that with all the new technologies uh, in the marketplace, it's a lot easier uh, for organizations to think about doing this a little bit more systematically and making sure that ultimately design thinking becomes a standard operating procedure uh, and it becomes essentially part of how the company is obviously going to be operating for the long run. So in our innovator spotlight, we have actually Hollister. This is a medical devices company and they really kind of take this concept to heart and they have a, an opportunity where they're co-creating and working firsthand with medical experts and select patients as they think about introducing new solutions in the marketplace. So Lynn, let's talk about design thinking at Honeywell. Absolutely. So uh, I agree with you, voice of customer, right? Everyone agrees that it is a smart strategic initiative. We talk about it a lot. We have great intentions, but really lackluster execution in reference to our customers. Calling a customer on the phone will only get you so far these days. Engagement, observation, interaction, those are the keys to truly understanding our customers' needs and identifying the problems to solve. I'd like to share with you a great example um, at Honeywell Integrated when we hosted a robotic experience day. This was a two-day event. We invited 20 customers from 10 different companies as well as our partners, our Fetch Robotics, Carnegie Mellon, really heavy hitters in the industry that we work alongside of to come up with the best robotic solutions for our customers. So we were not short on subject matter experts by any stretch. During this two-day event that we hosted, we, it was compiled of demonstrations and presentations of our robotic solutions. In addition, it was talked about, we gave information and leave behind so they had something that they could take with them and later research. We took it a step further and conducted a breakout session to not only capture the feedback from our customers from what they had just experienced, but also to talk about trends and talk about and get their thoughts on industry challenges. At the end of the day, we took a break from the structured agenda just to talk with our customers, get to know them, share industry experiences and swap stories. After the participants left and the event concluded, we advertised this incredibly successful event using social media with the full intention to drive even more engagement to our robotic products and solutions. Yes, it was a lot of work, a fantastically long two days. But insight, the insight gained from this experience was priceless. Ludwig? Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, please continue, Ludwig. Uh, let's do seven, and then there's one more question I want to ask. Fair enough. On behalf yes, of the I audience. think around, uh, number seven is obviously appropriately self-disruption, which is a very important concept in innovation. So, you know, when a, a tree gets wounded, it will immediately wall off the cave so that it doesn't spread to the rest of the tree as new wood is created to take over those functions. So similarly, an organization needs to think about how it protects its core business as it looks for new opportunities to transform and protect itself uh, in the long run. So we've seen this being done very effectively in our innovator spotlight with Whirlpool. They've actually uh, have a very interesting process in place where they're developing integrated technologies with their suppliers. Uh, so what you really see here and, and what we've discussed so far in the presentation really uh, comes to these five key concepts that ultimately help the organization think about how it's tackling the subject of innovation. So from a strategy perspective, does innovation really align with the strategy of the organization? From a culture perspective, is innovation really part of everyone's daily work? From a process perspective, is innovation work repeatable? Uh, techniques, 
and driving the right best practices for innovation being in place and making sure that from a metrics perspective, you are ha have the right measures and KPIs around your innovation efforts that are being uh, pursued. So what we've essentially actually done at Planbox, which is an interesting concept, is we have built a similar concept to the capability maturity model, but for innovation, you're invited to actually take this test on our website and see how your organization will fare. Probably a good idea to ask, uh, you know, uh, five to ten people to take the test because ultimately it's going to be their perception of innovation in your organization. And you will essentially rank from a level one to a level five. The reality is that 80% of the companies are going to be a level one or a level two, meaning they're either depending on the heroics of a few or really pursuing innovation in a very departmental way. And of course, what the organization really wants to be doing and what these more innovative uh, organizations are doing are establishing innovation as a standard operating procedure and going to a level four where all innovation work aligns with strategy as the organization thinks about how it actually optimizes its innovation efforts on an ongoing basis by having the right continuous improvement and feedback loops that are built in. So let me maybe ask Lynn to give a quick comment on how self-disruption has been applied at Honeywell. Yeah, so quickly, um, as previously mentioned, our monthly scorecard and key performance indicators tell us how we're doing. So this is our source of truth. So because of this fact, we can qu quickly identify issues and make course corrections. Couple that with our Innovation Steering Committee, who conducts a monthly review of alignment and, analy and analyzes our pipeline content for future resource allocation and to prime the pump for our breakthrough initiatives. Finally, we conduct risk assessments on our research and technology ideas, focusing on market position, intellectual property protection. These are a way that we can proactively address potential competitive threats. And last but not least, we look under our own hood at our innovation program and tools. Are they, be, are they the best that they can be, and are they serving the needs of our community as well as our organization? Ludwig? Thanks, Lynn. Any uh, comments, John? Yeah, I just want to go and wrap this up and say you guys have really shared, I think, a very compelling story of, of a concept that was really nicely applied. Um, Lynn, I mean, I, this sounded all, you know, extremely powerful and right on. There was one question that was asked earlier by Giorgio in the in the call, and I think that's the last question I want to ask, and maybe you can answer that in one minute, which we have. <laughs> um, what was the change, the big change you must have encountered some, somewhere? What was the big challenge in all of this uh, implementation work um, across all these um, these five buckets that was that were shared? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. In all of the in, in implementing the core concept that Ludwig shared into your organization, what was the what was the biggest challenge that you encountered in your in your company, in your organization? Oh, without a doubt, cultural acceptance. Hmm. Um, um, making it a priority. It's not just another thing that they have to do. Um, it's something that we would want to do. Um, it's something that will um, progress our, our, our company forward. Not only that, is that it empowers our associates. They feel like they have a say or a part in the success of the organization. But culturally, it was a sell. I don't, I, I don't mind to tell you that was a challenge of ours. And how did you, how did you get over it? How did you bring it about? How, how, how did you yeah. sell it, <laughs> in your, in, in yeah. your words? Right. So um, basically what we did is that we um, had um, innovation promotion teams really be our advocates. So our ecosystem not only helped us manage and progress ideas through the system, they also helped tell the story of why it's important. These are subject matter experts in our organizations that are viewed as very respectable in innovators within our company. And so we uh, use leverage that organization and their knowledge to help sell our story and speak the language of why it's important. Excellent. Thank you for those final insights. Thank you, Ludwig and Lynn, again, for, I think, a very compelling story. I hope you found illustration and inspiration. Um, we have not been able to answer all questions. We're going to do that, as promised, over email. Thank you for uh, taking the effort and the initiative. Um, if you like what you have um, heard, actually, do the, please do the evaluation, um, whether you like it or not, um, in both, both ways. 
Um, and if you like it, please share this to, uh, to those around you, um, starting maybe from your organization and or your leaders. Um, thanks all for having paid the, the attention, um, uh, having stayed up late or being getting up early. Um, and, um, and I hope to see you again in a few months when we go into our next edition in the sequence. Good weekend, Lynn. Thanks again. Thank you to everybody. Goodbye. See you next time. Goodbye. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.